Let's ask God for light. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our mind that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and be taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading this evening is Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. The title of the homily on this Ash Wednesday is Comfort for Mourners. Matthew 5, verse 4. Hear now the word of the Lord. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It's a saying we have heard many times, but it's a rather odd saying. It almost is missing something. It's like a sentence that needs another word as an object missing or a subject missing. The question that verse raises in our mind, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, is what in particular are we to mourn? What is the focus of our mourning? What is the object or subject of our mourning? Are we, are we to mourn death? Is that what we're to mourn? We often think of mourning in those terms. Are we to mourn human suffering? Is that what Christ is calling us to mourn? What exactly does Jesus want us to mourn? In this text, what is the kind of mourning that brings comfort, that brings this blessing that Jesus offers in this beatitude? Commentators have debated that very question, and there's a lot of disagreement on that. But I think there's good reason to believe that what Jesus is calling us to mourn in this verse, in this beatitude, is our sin. Is sin itself, sin, our sin, the sin in the world, the existence of sin, what it does. Jesus calls us to mourn our sin. David Gushy and Glenn Stason, they're theologians, they summarized this beatitude this way. They said, in a nutshell, blessed are those who mourn what is wrong and unjust in themselves and the world. Jesus calls us to mourn. Sin, the promise of the beatitude, the promise of Jesus is that those who mourn their sin will be comforted. And that's what we have come here to do tonight. That's what Ash Wednesday is about. It's this beginning of this Lenten season where in which we mourn our sin. But that raises the question about why. Why should we mourn sin? What's so bad about it that we are to give to it this mourning, this focus of our mourning? Let's think about that for a moment. What is it about sin? What's so bad about it? Why should we mourn it? There's an old joke uh, Democrats would tell about President Coolidge. He was a man who was known of being of a man of few words. And the president uh, attended church one Sunday while Mrs. Coolidge remained in the White House. And on his return, anxious that she might have missed something important in the sermon that day, she asked her husband about the sermon topic. What was it about? She asked him, uh, what, did the ser what was the sermon about? What did he speak about? And he replied to her, he spoke about sin. And she said to him, well, what did he say? And Coolidge said, he was against it. He was a man of few words. And in a way, you could say the reason why we should mourn sin is because God is against it, right? There are many things that get debated in theology. There's a variety of different doctrines and different denominations and different theologies. But I think almost everyone agrees that God is against sin, that God 
hates sin. And so one of the reasons we could say that we should mourn it is because God is against it. It's at odds with who God is, His very nature. And that's true, right? I mean, that is true, but I'm not sure that's, entire, that's a complete answer. A full answer to the question about why we should mourn sin. I think there's something deeper to what Jesus is driving at, because He's talking to us. He was talking to people in this sermon, humans, like you and me. I think there's a deeper reason why we should mourn our sin. And I think that's because sin imprisons us. It enslaves us. It holds us captive. And most of all, it distorts us. It distorts everything. What God intended for this world, for us as people, how we were to treat each other and this world, sin distorts all of that. It makes us something less than we were meant to be. In C.S. Lewis's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, part of his Narnia Chronicles, the main antagonist character in that story is a guy named Eustace Scrub. And he's a character you don't like. He is the antagonist, right? He's self-centered. He's arrogant. And the very first line of that book, he's introduced this way. Lewis writes this, There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. And as the story unfolds, Eustace, you know, he shows himself to be that kind of person, and at one scene, he ends up uh, finding some dragon's gold, and he falls asleep upon it. He's, he's greedy for it, and when he wakes up, he has turned into a dragon. And Lewis notes that that transformation of Eustace into a dragon occurred because of his greedy, dragonish thoughts. It, it occurred because of his sin. This is a metaphor for what sin does to us. It makes us into something else, something God did not intend us to be something less than human, as God defines what it means to be human. That's what sin is. That's what sin does. It distorts us. It oppresses. It imprisons. It renders us less than human, less than what God intended us to be. And that's why I think Jesus calls us to mourn it. Mourn it because of what it does to us. So I'd ask you this evening, what is sin doing to you? What is it doing to you? What is it in your life that is enslaving you, that is imprisoning, in, imprisoning you, that's holding you captive? What is it in your life that distorts who you are, who God intended you to be, the image of God, humanity as God saw it? What is it in you? What is it that's slowly, in that kind of creeping way, transforming you into something less than what God has called you to be? And if you find that, if you do that self-examination, if you find it, and if you spend enough time, you will find it. You will know what sin is. And you'll know why God calls us to mourn it, to grieve over its presence. That's why we're to mourn sin, because it distorts us. But then the question comes up, what does mourning do about it? How does, how does mourning sin get us to that comfort that Jesus says in that verse? Blessed are those who mourn, mourn sin, for they will be comforted. How do we get from A to B? What good is this mourning, is sitting there fretting or you know, despairing or lamenting over our sin? How does it lead to comfort? What is the cause and effect chain? Well, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. He says, Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you felt a godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret. 
I think that's the key. I think that's what mourning does. Mourning our sin leads to this chain of events that ultimately leaves us in comfort. It leads us to the comfort that we find in Jesus. Mourning our sin, thinking about it, reflecting upon it, understanding it, seeing what it does to us, and lamenting that reality. It leads us to confess that sin. It leads us to repent of that sin. And most of all, it leads us to Jesus to deliver us from that sin. That sin that holds us captive, that imprisons us. Jesus came to set the captives free, to set us free from sin, to save us from sin, to liberate us. That's how I think we find comfort. And in that... When we go through that chain, what happens to us is that we are made undistorted. Jesus makes us whole again. He has come to make us what God intended us to be. That's what happened to our friend Eustace Scrub, by the way, in the story, in the Narnia story. He was restored. And the way he was restored is that one day he met Aslan. He met that great lion, that lion that, you, that Lewis used to represent Jesus. And Aslan meets him and tells him he has to bathe. He has to wash away his sin. But in order to do that, he tells him he has to undress first. And Eustace tries to do that. He tries to tear the scales, his dragon scales, off his body. He tries to get to that bottom layer. And every time he tries to do that, he can't do it. He can't undress on his own. And those scales are the metaphor for sin. And then Aslan addresses him and says, you'll have to let me undress you. You'll have to let me undress you. And slowly and even painfully, Aslan undresses him, removes the scales from him, and he bathes. And in the end, he's restored to being a boy. What God intended him to be. He was comforted. He was made whole. And then Aslan dressed him. He dressed him in new clothes. That's what Ash Wednesday is about. It's a time for us to mourn our sin. To let Jesus undress us. And to also allow him to comfort us. By granting to us the new clothes. The robes of righteousness that only he can give us. Through his death. In his resurrection. So on this Ash Wednesday, let's join together to mourn our sin and to find our comfort in Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we, your people, have joined together on this Ash Wednesday. To mark the beginning of this season of Lent. And we do that by mourning our sin before you. By confessing. By repenting. By seeking you. The only one who can set us free. The only one who can comfort your people. We pray to you in Jesus name. Amen.